Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, this book, How the World Thinks. And I just really want to give a, a flavour of it, really, and try and give some sense of why there is uh, some purpose and merit and value in finding out a bit about philosophy from outside of the West, even if you're not particularly interested in, in philosophy, actually. Uh, if you're interested in philosophy, even more so a reason to do it, but not necessarily. So let me just um, begin a little bit by getting an idea of what we're talking about here when we talk about global philosophy. Um, now, I think that when people do talk about global philosophy, the first thing that comes to mind are three major and ancient traditions that go back to classical times, all three of which really emerged at roughly the same period in history, which is in itself quite interesting because it doesn't seem to be a common cause. It just seems that perhaps at that stage in human development, we had reached a point where our thinking naturally sort of uh, moved in a more philosophical direction. And what we really mean by a philosophical way of thinking is one which sort of puts sort of reason and evidence and inquiry at the basis of our worldview and our understanding, rather than, let us just say, you know, mythology and just sort of, and, and stories and part handed down tales. And these three major traditions, uh, the map's a little bit inaccurate, but it's pointing. Uh, there is uh, the Confucian tradition in China, 551 BCE, roughly was when Confucius was, was born. Interestingly, in the Confucian tradition, uh, Confucius claimed he wasn't inventing anything at all. He was trying to preserve the wisdom of the ancient sage kings. So although this is the first time we get like systematic written texts recognizably as philosophy, the claim is that the wisdom comes from before that. And there's a, a similar idea in, in, in India. In, in India, I think uh, the, the ancient Vedas, the sacred texts go back a very, very long time. And um, the orthodox schools of Indian philosophy claim still that these are sacred texts and what they really offer are, are interpretations. But the real sort of turn came around the time of the Buddha, roughly you know, 480 BCE. And what Buddhism introduced, again, was this idea of a kind of a critical, rational reflection on these ideas, which then generated and provoked a kind of a more rational, reasoned response in those uh, traditional schools. So Buddhism isn't an orthodox school of uh, Indian philosophy because it rejects the Vedas as having any kind of special claim to knowledge. But the kind of more systematic argument-based approach brought in by Buddhism really kind of led to the whole tradition taking a philosophical turn. And then, of course, uh, if you're viewing from Chichester, uh, the tradition you're probably most familiar with is that of the, the one that began in ancient Greece. Of course, before the time of Socrates, we have the phrase the pre Socratics, but particularly Socrates, born around 470 BCE, and then Plato and Aristotle. They say these three traditions seem to have emerged independently, which is, is a whole question mark about why they did. Um, they, there was a certain amount of um, trade between the Middle East, the Mediterranean and India. So it was possible there was some intellectual uh, trading going along as well, particularly with China and India, but actually there's very little concrete evidence of that. It's, it's rather circumstantial. Over time, these traditions sort of did, did develop. So in particular, uh, Buddhism spread all across East Asia, through China, through Japan, changing as it went. One of the more interesting transitions that we don't hear so much about in the West, but is really important, is that uh, the, there was this so-called golden age of Islamic philosophy in the Middle Ages, in sort of what is now North Africa, and for a long while, Southern Spain too. Andalusia, you probably know, was, was Al-Andalus, and it was under Muslim rule for quite a long time. And this golden age, there really was a flourishing of, of science, astronomy, uh, philosophy as well. And a lot of these uh, philosophers were very interested in, in Aristotle in particular, uh, the Greek philosophy, particularly Aristotle. And they translated a lot of his texts into Arabic. And it's actually through those translations that a lot of them came to, to Europe. So we kind of have that Islamic golden age to thank for the transmission of Aristotle to, uh, to Europe. So that's kind of, uh, let me go back actually, that's kind of the picture we have of 
philosophy around the world. However, there are uh, other traditions which could have a claim to also be part of this story. And what's really perhaps most missing from this are those traditions which don't have that history of texts, the oral traditions. Uh, I'm thinking of large swathes of Africa. There's quite a lot of uh, written philosophy from particularly Ethiopia going back several hundred years, but predominantly African thought was transmitted orally, as was the case for the uh, First Peoples of Australia, as is the case for the uh, Maori of New Zealand. And of course, South America, the Americas aren't even on this map uh, because they don't fit that, they don't have those traditions of written texts going back centuries. But again, there, there is kind of evidence of like, philosophical thinking that went on and transmitted orally. Now, of course, until recently, uh, people really didn't consider any of that kind of philosophy. They considered it kind of folk wisdom, folklore, tradition. But in recent decades, there's been more of a, an appreciation that maybe, you know, you can get some genuinely stuff of genuine philosophical interest from there. So in addition to these sort of great written traditions, there's also interest in the oral traditions of these other societies. So that's kind of a global philosophy. And of course, what's quite interesting about that is that if you were to study philosophy in a British university or an American university, uh, probably to be honest, a European university as well, you wouldn't be studying most of this stuff. You would be studying only that one tradition, the tradition which came, comes out of ancient Greece. And you might ask, well, why is that? That might seem a bit strange that philosophy, which is a discipline which is supposedly you know, a universal one, is actually studied in a way which seems incredibly parochial. And the standard answer to that is that, well, the thing is that, yes, we use this word philosophy to describe these other traditions as well, but they're kind of like parallel traditions. In other words, there were these big questions of the nature of reality, who we are, how we should live. And these have been addressed in many different cultures and, and the schools that have addressed that, we, we kind of call philosophy, but there's such a difference in the approaches of say, you know, Confucius and the Taoists in China or the Buddhists in India, and certainly in the oral traditions that to, to think of this as one discipline is to put too much in the same bag. And so what we really have to think of is that philosophy and the clue being in the name, it really describes a particular tradition. It's the philosophia, the love of wisdom which came out of ancient Greece. And although we may be interested in these other traditions and for what they have to say, they're not really doing philosophy as we recognized it. And so, um, you know, without being disrespectful, if you're interested in philosophy, in our sense, you have no reason at all to, to, to look at these other traditions. And people leave that then to these sort of anthropologists or the historians or you know, what they call area studies. So if you do Chinese studies or so forth. And I have to admit that for a long time, I kind of thought that was right. Because if I did pick up a text of like Indian philosophy or Chinese philosophy, or I tried to listen to a talk about it, it just seemed to be so different that you know, it didn't seem to be recognizably philosophy as we knew it. And so, um, although I, you know, was open to the idea. I was very comfortable with the fact that at the end of the day, I didn't know much about this and I didn't think I needed to. But over recent years, the last couple of decades, quite recently, I think increasingly there have been uh, scholars in the field of what has come to be known as comparative philosophy, which really means philosophy in more than one tradition, who have made the case quite convincingly that the overlap between these different traditions is stronger than that. So it's not just the case that they, they're interested in the same questions and approach them in completely different ways. It's not only that they're interested in the same questions, but they actually approach them in, in ways which are rather overlapping. It's an emphasis on reason, argument, and so forth. And a lot of the differences are more superficial than you might think. They're more about a, of style, about the references, who they're referring to, and all these things. And actually, you can go further than this and say, to the extent that there are differences in approaches, that's something which should be philosophically interesting. Because, you know, as a philosopher, you shouldn't assume that the approach we take to these questions in the Western uh, tradition 
are necessarily the only or the best ones. So in that sense, the sort of the strangeness and unfamiliarity of the way in which these issues are approached is all the more reason to take uh, them into account. So I, I kind of over the years became gradually more and more embarrassed by my ignorance of non-Western philosophy. And writing a book about it, in a sense, became my commitment strategy to find out more. And also, of course, there's an opportunity there because even now, if you were to sort of go on to your favorite book website, and the clue is it's not Amazon, uh, and Google away and have a look at you know, books on global philosophy, it's still quite, there aren't many. There just aren't many, really. There are books on Chinese philosophy or Indian philosophy. There are plenty of books on those. But global surveys remain fairly thin on the ground. And in particular, if you wanted to find one which you could pick up and read as a layperson rather than as a set text to study in an academic environment, I think really before mine, there's hardly anything. So um, there was an opportunity <laughs> to write a book which I thought needed to be written. And, I, and, and that's spurred my interest as well. Of course, it's such a huge field, I couldn't pretend that I was going to become an expert in this, but that's not kind of the way I work. Um, the, the way I kind of write and the way I work is, there are some issues where I perhaps, you know, go in more depth, but I, I, and this one in particular, I approach it more or less like a philosophical journalist is the way I put it. Now, as I have my philosophical training, I have a certain skills and knowledge which are hopefully useful to this. But the way to, to, to tell this story, to bring out the key themes, is to, is to speak to the real experts who, who, who really know their stuff, read the key texts and go back to those key primary sources, and then try and just bring it all together in a way that makes sense. So that's what I wanted to do. But there's another aspect of this which was turned out to be really interesting. I wondered early on when this project began about whether or not finding out about uh, the philosophical traditions of regions and countries would teach you anything about how the, the thinking that goes on in those places now. And, you know, I, I asked that question explicitly of the various different experts I met. So I would say, you know, do you think that if you want to understand India today, it's useful to understand something about classical Indian philosophy. And the answer was pretty much always yes. There's only one dissenter, and the one dissenter was actually not a philosopher and was a dissenter in general, actually. So a bit of an iconoclast. Everyone kind of agreed that it did. And, and I think that as I, as I looked, I, I realised this was true. And I'm going to, in the talk, for the rest of the talk, just give two examples of a couple of ideas that really come out when you look at comparative philosophy. And I'm going to try and show how they do shed light on the cultures that gave birth to them. But also, interestingly, of course, then shed light back on our own uh, by putting what is familiar in contrast to something unfamiliar. Um, I think you often you begin to notice things about it that you hadn't noticed before. Um, this might seem like a silly example, but this is the one, if you remember one thing from the scene, this would be more useful. It's like craft chocolate, right? If you want to, you know, craft chocolate may seem to be overpriced and fancy and everything, but I, I tell you this, if you get two bars of it and you taste one after the other, that's the way of really, really highlighting to you how much difference and richness there is in the different tastes. I'm sure that the same goes for having two, two wines together. It's by contrast that we sometimes brings out what goes unnoticed without a contrast. So before I just um, go into these couple of ideas, I just want to go over what I call these three deadly sins of comparative philosophy. Uh, the first one is what I call domesticating. Uh, domesticating is when we, we see an, we look at other cultures, we, we see an idea in that culture. It has a certain similarity to an idea on our own culture. And we just say, oh, that's their version of this, right? And we kind of go no further. You know, it's a bit like uh, a bad way of learning languages, whereby what you're always looking for is a one-to-one -one relationship between the words in the foreign language and the words in your own. You only really get good at a foreign language when you realize that a lot of words actually don't translate in that simple one-to-one -one way. They have different nuances of meaning. 
And although there's overlap, there, there's quite a bit of difference uh, between them, in, 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 even just in their usage. So in the same kind of way, you can find all sorts of ideas which are, have similarities with our own, but unless you do pay attention to what's different about them, then you don't really learn. You don't really get anything from it and you don't get that new light. So that's domesticating is sort of basically acting almost like a premise that we already have all the ideas we need. And the only thing we're doing when we're looking in other cultures is to find their equivalents. There's an equal and opposite mistake, which is exoticizing. This is where we kind of imagine that other cultures are so different from our own that they have ways of thinking or being, which you know, are kind of almost you know, beyond our comprehension. They're like living in a different realm. Um, I, I, I sometimes find this uh, kind of way of thinking is implicit sometimes in the way some people talk about India. I'm always quite sort of uh, amused when people say India is such a spiritual culture. People in India are so spiritual. Um, in the context of this talk, of course, it's quite interesting that India has had a very strong humanist movement, by the way. But also, I mean, it, it's certainly true that in India, uh, what we might call religious matters are more important than they are in the more secularized West. But you only have to spend like two days in the country to recognize the fact that they have a lot. Indians have this, guess what, the same concerns as other people. They want to eat, they want to get jobs, they want to have a better future for their children. And, you know, just saying they're spiritual people is like exoticizing them. It's like making Indians seem like they're a different species of human. So it, although in a strange way, it's, it's seen as praise, but it's actually otherizing people in a way which has unfortunate um, parallels to the way people otherwise for negative reasons. So you don't want to either domesticate or exoticize. You want to be open to difference in, but in a way in which you kind of, you know, appreciate the fact that uh, we're all human beings. And if there is something different and interesting there, we can learn from it too. It, this isn't just a philosophy made for a different category of human being of no interest to ourselves. Um, the third one is essentializing. And this one is, is very hard to do. In summary, I will be saying stuff like Indian philosophy, Chinese philosophy, European philosophy, Western philosophy. Of course, these are all huge, huge categories. There's a huge amount of diversity within those things. And essentializing would be to kind of, it would be a form of overgeneralizing in a way. It would be like saying that, you know, imagining that all Chinese philosophy shares a common characteristic or all Indian philosophy shares a common characteristic. Now, that's not true. That doesn't mean, though, you can't make general statements about the culture. I remember early on when I was still in this project, someone was having a go at me um, before they'd even read what I'd said <laughs> on the basis that I couldn't possibly talk about Indian philosophy. It was so different. But you know, there, there are generalizations which are true, as long as they're not taken to be essentializing universalizations. So, for example, one can talk about differences between men and women, and talking about men and women here, in, 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 the, in the context of biological sex. And you could say something like men are taller than women. Of course, it doesn't mean that all men are taller than all women. It's, but on average, typically, men are taller than women. That's true. So as long as you remember, the generalization is not a universal statement. It's uh, actually just uh, pointing to, to sort of general trends. You can make comments about, you can make comments about the general thrust of Chinese philosophy, Indian philosophy, and so forth. But, it's really important to remember that what we're not doing there is essentializing. Anyway, let me get on with a couple of examples or else we won't have time for them. I just want to pick on two, essentially. Um, the first one is, uh, it comes from China. And this is a nice, simple one. It's an easy one to get hold of. You can grasp it, you know, a bit like what well, I can't remember that game. This is a minute to learn, a lifetime to, to master. Um, you can get a grasp of what the idea is very, very quickly. But then all the complexities would take much, much more study. The concept is a concept of, of, of harmony, and it's something which is ubiquitous in, in China. This is a, a English language school in Beijing, and find your harmony is their slogan. It sounds really odd in English, doesn't it? Find your harmony. It doesn't sound odd in China because harmony is the preeminent political, social, and ethical value. I think you can say that harmony occupies the same central place 
in you know, politics and ethics as con the related concepts like freedom and autonomy do in the West. It's absolutely at the heart of things. And uh, indeed, you see the word being used a lot in uh, official government communications, also in newspaper reports. It is just kind of everywhere. It goes back a long way. Uh, this is in uh, the Confucius's temple in Chufu. And one of these gates is the gate of supreme harmony or something. And if you, in the Forbidden City, uh, there are at least three different halls of various different harmonies and gates of harmony. It's everywhere, basically. Um, now, what does harmony mean? Why is harmony important? Well, from what we know, what, what everyone knows about China, one might be very suspicious of this idea of harmony. One might think what harmony means is a kind of you know, collectivism and a conformity and everyone knowing their place and towing the line. Because again, people don't know much about Confucianism generally, but they tend to know it's all about you know, filial piety, order in society, hierarchy, etc. And certainly, if you go through Chinese history, there's quite a lot of that kind of uh, you know, know thy place. This is the Forbidden City in, in Beijing. And uh, these two people who are overlooking it from the hill uh, wouldn't have been able to do that for most of Chinese history. They would have actually been executed. Uh, you know, such was the gulf between the royalty and the ordinary citizen, that the ordinary citizen wasn't even able to look on where they lived. And this hill was out of bounds to, to commoners. So you might be suspicious and might say harmony to me sounds like a very nice word for something unpleasant, which is conformity, rigidity and social hierarchy. Well, be careful. It's true that in history there's been a lot of that. But then, frankly, if you look at the history of the West, the history of the West was highly hierarchical and highly ordered. Um, you know, I, All Things Bright and Beautiful is a, is a hymn that was still sung at school when I was there. And it had the line, the, the rich man in his castle, the poor man at, at his gate. God made them high and lowly and ordered their estate. Um, so, you know, one can't sort of judge the enduring essence of an idea on the basis of how it was applied in more feudal and hierarchical times. Because actually, even if you go back to Confucius, Mencius, the Confucian texts, um, harmony was never meant to mean that pure uniformity. And one of the strongest, one of those common metaphors to explain harmony is by example of a soup or this called a congee I think which is a kind of a porridge type thing. It, what makes for a harmony in a soup is not sameness. If you only have like one ingredient or all the same ingredient or two similar ingredients you get a very bland unappetizing soup. What makes for a good soup is precisely diversity. You need a good broth, you need the right vegetables, you need the right meat or uh, vegetable proteins are available herbs, spices, all these things together create the harmony of the whole. And the other great metaphor, of course, is the obvious musical one. I know harmony has a very particular meaning in Western classical music, but if we take the looser sense, a piece of music is harmonious. This requires different instruments, different notes, different lines playing together. And often the most beautiful piece of music is precisely one where you have that interplay between the different instruments in a way where each is doing something different, but somehow they all come together and create that whole. So the ideal of harmony is not actually based on, on uniformity. Uh, canonically, it is not based on uniformity, it's about difference. And in a sense, achieving a harmony is as much of an art as it is a science. So to achieve the harmonious society, the, the wise ruler has to know how to balance all these different elements. And that's there. I mean, it, it, it is acknowledged today. Um, I think it was in Shanghai rather than Beijing at, at one of the national museums. They had a whole floor devoted to the different ethnic groups of China. And officially, it is celebrating these. And it does so because in the Chinese tradition, harmony is important. And you recognize the difference. You recognize the diversity. And you boast that your country is harmonious, not because it's eradicated all differences, but because it has brought these differences into harmony. Now, the fact is, of course, that as a matter of fact, the Chinese Communist Party, 
is not advocating a policy of harmony in a traditional Confucian sense at all. When it talks about harmonization, it is in fact a euphemism. This is a euphemism for uniformity. So actually what they're trying to do is spread Han Chinese culture and suppress other minorities. And of course, most horrifically in the case of the Uyghurs. But the fact that the Chinese Communist Party are abusing the notion doesn't mean the notion doesn't have merit at all. In fact, it has very strong merit. And this is where I think it's quite interesting. Because of course, I think that if you understand that harmony is the, the, the preeminent value in China, you can, you can understand why it is that there isn't more of a demand for democracy. Because democracy, and I'm not saying, by the way, that Chinese people don't want or won't, wouldn't, wouldn't want to have democracy in the future. But it doesn't have the same urgency. Because de the, the democracy has an urgency to it when you think the most important thing is individuals expressing their right over how they are ruled and, and, and getting their choice of government wherever possible. But if you think the most important thing is that society is harmonious, then actually you don't have that same urgency. The most important thing is the harmony. And you may fear democracy. You may fear democracy because democracy can bring with it division. Democracy can bring with it different parties, different factions. It can split a society. And in a culture, so a country so huge as China, that is a very, very real threat. So on the one hand, obviously, the way in which the Chinese Communist Party keeps its stranglehold on the country is something that you don't have to agree with. To see the point, though, that nonetheless, the, the desire for, for harmony, the desire that the, the whole hangs together in its difference, can be a, a very strong motivation. And then what I think is interesting there is then you turn back and use that as a mirror to look upon our own culture, because we don't talk about harmony as a political or moral value, but actually implicitly, we all do value it. We, we, you know, when there's disharmony in society, we notice, and we're noticing it at the moment, I think, uh, the way in which society has become polarized, the way in which you know, these, sort of the, these, these walls of incomprehension between you know, the, the, the leavers and remainers and all these other divisions that, that happen um, you know, there is disharmony and it's not good. It's not good for society and we want more of it. But we don't have this sort of moral and political vocabulary in which we can talk about this and articulate it. So I kind of think that it would be really useful if we could actually think about harmony as a social value and think about how we might promote it, not as an alternative to freedom, democracy and autonomy, but as one good amongst many. Now, on this point, I wanted to bring in a, a, a really key point. Uh, Tom Kasulis, who uh, one of the comparative philosophers I, I, I most admired researching the book, made this really good point, which is that when people are comparing cultures, they tend to reach for binary distinctions. The East collectivist, the West individualistic, for example, you know, um, India, knowledge based on revelation, you know, West knowledge based on empirical evidence and so forth. And, and these are just always simple caricatures. They never really work. What is true, however, is that there's a difference between what is foreground and background in different cultures. So it, it is true that, and we'll, we'll see this in a minute, and there are aspects of, of our collectivity which have a greater stress in the East today and aspects of autonomy and individualism which have greater stress in the West. But in both cultures, both these things matter. So it's about what's foreground and background. And I think this is really important thing about harmony. Harmony is in our background, it's in the background. We don't really think about it. Maybe we benefit by putting it a bit more in the foreground. How we do that? Well, maybe we can learn a bit how to do that by studying those traditions where it is in the foreground. Let me just move on briefly to a second uh, idea I want to talk about. And these are conceptions of the self. I mean, on the one hand, it seems strange, we're all human beings, uh, so in a sense, you might think we're all the same. And yet it does seem that the way we think of ourselves varies quite a lot from culture to culture. And I think that the way people often stereotype it is that in the East, and particularly in the East, it's collectivist, whereas we are in the West individualistic. And, you know, you see these pictures from the shopping districts in Japan in which uh, the lights change, people cross the road in, the, in these huge crowds, but in a very, very orderly fashion. 
and it kind of looks like you know um, you can be, be in a dehumanized sense people kind of say oh it looks like you know ants moving or something like that you know it's like people are behaving as like a hive as a big group and and there is this idea that essentially that's the difference collectivism versus individualism um, but i think that when you look at the way in which self <coughs> is conceptualized outside of the west it's not actually that's not the key distinction it's not individual and collective it's something else so what is it well, I really got it, I think, finally, when I was leaving Japan. I was lucky to do some travel in the days when one could travel. And leaving Japan, uh, the flight had a lot of Japanese people on it, and lots of them were watching the same in-flight movie. I noticed that, so I tuned in and watched it myself. And it was a teen romance, a teen manga called Orange. It was number one at the box office in its first week of opening. And this film was really interesting because as I said it's like a teen romance but the important thing about this teen romance was that the way in which the story played out it was all in the context of this six-person friendship group the the, rom the romance of the, of the couple the couple didn't kind of exist in a vacuum in isolation which is actually often what happens if you think about it most romantic comedies romantic films um, they center entirely on the couple and you just get these like little side things where, you know, a uh, little scene where someone talks to their best friend about what's going on on the side, you know, as a way of getting background information in. But it's almost like no one else exists other than the couple in this romance. Whereas in this one, it was all about the friendship group. I, I haven't got time to go into the plot. It, it involves time travel and everything, but it's really, really heavily into that. And this is a heavily metaphorical moment in the film, a bit heavy handed, I think, where, you know, they're carrying this crash map for a school sports day and their friends appear and say, we'll help you carry the load, right? This is, this is spreading it. Now, the point here is that this isn't about collectivism. It's about what is usually called the relational aspect of being an individual so, or our relationality. And the key point here is not that the collective has this kind of primacy. It's rather that you cannot understand what it is to be an individual person except by understanding yourself in relation to others. It is because you are a classmate, a colleague, a father, a son, a mother, a daughter, a sibling, uh, a neighbor, all, all these relations are, are what make us who we are. And you cannot abstract out the individual from that because we are fundamentally social creatures born into a social world, brought up dependent upon people who we're brought up with and, and going on to live in a society in which we're dependent on everyone else. And this relationality is not the enemy of individuality. I mean, in this scene, they're all wearing a school uniform. And even though I don't speak Japanese and I was only looking at the subtitles, it was very, very clear that all of these six kids had very, very different and distinctive personalities. They really were fully formed individuals. But being a fully formed individual didn't mean that they uh, existed in a vacuum. They existed in relation to others. Um, and you may be skeptical about this. You may say, "How? if that's true, why is it then I see um, tourists from countries like Japan and, and China taking selfies of themselves? Doesn't this show that if this was ever true, it's not true anymore. We, we all be, it's be, The world has become a world of individuals. I don't think that's true, actually, because you've got to ask yourself, why are you taking a selfie? And there are at least two reasons you'd be taking a selfie. And perhaps for a lot of people, both of them have a role. One of them is a kind of a look at me kind of thing, displaying your individuality, showing off your specialness. The other one is actually much simpler. It's sharing the moment with the people who are not there. It's all about your relationality. And I'm pretty sure that from what I know about these cultures, that that's a large part of what's going on with these selfies. Um, these, these Japanese uh, young people at a Shinto shrine in Kyoto, are, I don't think, uh, displaying, uh, being narcissistic in their selfies. I'm pretty sure they're sharing these moments with the friends who are not there. It's all about their relationality. And this relationality also, I think, is a part of what gives the enduring respect for a culture. This is a Shinto shrine in, in Tokyo. And you've got people here you can look at them look at the way they're dressed you know and all this and you look at how educated japan is as a culture 
I don't think that the reason, the primary reason why so many people still go to these shrines is that they believe that they're going to get special favors from the kami if they leave their coin offerings. I think that participating in these social rituals is just a way of acknowledging your, your relation to others, your dependence, the fact that you are from a culture, you belong to it, and you owe something to it. So here again is an example, I think, of how, you know, if you think, of it, if you think about self in relational terms and you realise that's what's in the foreground in somewhere like Japan, then on the one hand, you are understanding Japan, China, places like this better. You're not falling for the simple fallacy that it's just a collectivist culture where individuality doesn't matter. But then it also gives you a resource to look back at our own culture. And I think most people, I've yet to meet anyone who said that the problem with Western civilization is that it's not individualistic enough. Most people say the opposite. They think we've become too atomized, too individualistic, too separated from others. But of course, if you think the alternative to that is collectivism, you're rightly gonna run a mile. You're gonna think, well, you know, that's just the price we kind of pay. But if you realize it's not about that, it's rather about whether or not we get back in touch with our relationality and emphasize those things. You can see, you know, that we can have our individuality, but we can also get, build those ties of relationality and, and recognize them. And of course we know they're important. No man is an island entire unto itself, John Donne. And the reason why we say that, uh, we say that because we recognize it's true, but we also say it because it needs to be said, because in an individualistic culture, we're always in danger of emphasizing our autonomy and difference so much that we slip away from it. So here's, here's another idea which not only gives us a great insight into other cultures, it gives us an insight into our own and a way, way of looking at it. I'm probably gonna skip a slide because I wanna have plenty of time for questions, but you know, this, this idea that you can um, understand all aspects of a culture better if you understand a bit about the philosophy comes up time and time again. This is the Alhambra in Andalusia and uh, when you understand that, you know, a ceiling like this is in a way intended to convey the awe which one should feel in the presence of, of God, an awe in which there is this oneness and unity and perfection, but it kind of defies your full comprehension. You can't take it in, in one glance. It's too, too, too perfect for you then you can kind of see that, you know, you understand the architecture better. This isn't just an amazing piece of architecture. This is telling us something about the cultural values it comes from. Um, that this one is just a sign about housing development, which has the slogan, live in Confucianism, life is harmony. I just think it tells you the ubiquity of harmony in China and also how, um, you know, uh, how, how alive the philosophy is there. Um, this is a lovely uh, uh, example of how relationality manifests itself in Japan. A sign on the underground saying any masterpiece just becomes noise disturbance when emanating from earphones. Um, this isn't a sign which is telling you to do anything. It's simply pointing out to you that if your, noise, if your music comes out of your headphones, it's noise for other people. And in a culture where people are very highly aware of their relationality, signs like this can work, right? Just simply being reminded of the antisocial nature is enough to, to, make it, to, to make it kind of work. And this is a final one, which I um, really love, the loving service area, Shanghai train station. Um, this is what we call the baby changing area. Uh, I think what, so, so the contrast is really interesting. We could, it could be called anything. Why is it called the loving service area? And this is a faithful translation apparently. And why is it a, baby changing area in, in, in our culture. Well, in our culture, we've become very utilitarian, very functional. You know, this is the way we see things. It's about changing the baby. Um, in China, there's still that idea of familial values, okay? And so, um, you know, these are family values are important. And not only that, it can be warm. It's loving service. It's not just filial piety in that strict, stereotypical Confucian way. So I am going to skip these next slides. You'll have to sort of, you can ask me what they're about if you want. Um, because I do want to have time for questions. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to end on that slide there. Thank you very much for your attention. I do hope we do have some time for questions and, and discussion. Happy to ask, answer things.
I'll um, I'll kick things off while we wait for people to type things in the chat. Um, you mentioned that you wrote the the book, um, and, and you partly to increase your own awareness of, of other um, philosophical cultures. Do, do you feel like there's a, a problem with the way we think about philosophy and education in this country, or um, is that just your own personal experience? Um, the problem with anything about philosophy, like in schools and in universities, mm, um, yeah. I think there were quite a few problems, <laughs> actually. Um, I don't, I, it's, it's, it's a typical kind of self-serving moment, isn't it, to say that your subject doesn't get as much attention as it should. But I think, you know, in this case, I think, I think it's not just a self-serving bias, I don't think. A lot of people would agree that it does seem odd that we don't have any philosophy of school at all in, in school school education um, and I, I think that should change I, but I, I'd rather like I, I, my ideal would not be teaching philosophy it'd be to incorporate philosophical issues and questions in, across the curriculum so for example I would like people to sort of have, do some philosophy of science questions in their science and philosophy of history questions in history and, and, and consider philosophical issues as they arise in things like English literature, which, which, which I did, you know, I, I didn't, there's no philosophy at my school, but we did English literature at A-level, and I, I think there's quite a lot of philosophy that went on in there. Um, but more generally, yeah, I mean, it's, A, it's a problem that's marginalised, but I think it is a problem that has been very, very, very narrow. I mean, the narrowness is actually more than just um, Western or non-Western. Within the Western tradition, uh, most British universities only teach what's called this analytic tradition, which um, uh, has that ancient Greek roots, but it took a kind of different direction from a lot of philosophy in Europe after Kant. And so, you know, we don't, they don't study things like phenomenologists or existentialists, that's kind of funny European nonsense. And then they study their own people. And, and worse than that, um, a lot of these issues ended up getting, dis they, they became kind of self-perpetuating debates. So you know, you, people were writing about Davidson's response to Quine, for example, and when actually it wasn't really clear that if you're interested in the fundamental issues of philosophy that you should even be reading Quine or Davidson in the first place, great philosophers though they were in their own ways. So I think there has been a problem, but it's really, really changing. It, it's been taking a long time to change, but I think it has opened up quite a bit now, and we are seeing uh, more openness and more diversity. At the same time, you know, you can't do everything. So I do appreciate the fact that people should have their specialisms, particularly in academia. So, you know, we're not, we're never going to, we, it would probably be undesirable to get to a stage where every philosophy department felt it had to be entirely representative of all different philosophies around the world. But the fact that that's an impossibility doesn't mean that there shouldn't be more diversity than there has been. Let's say it is coming in now. Right, thank you for that. Um, we've got a question from Ramona, who's asking, what was the Dark Side of the Moon slide about? <laughs> ah, there we go, the Dark Side of the Moon slide. Let's, um, let's have a look, shall we? Um, so, yeah. Um, oh, can I go back? Uh, maybe I can't. Yeah. No, I can't. Sorry about that. Um, so, the Dark Side of the Moon, then, well, in, in those last slides, I was trying to summarise three benefits of doing comparative philosophy so perhaps i'll just do that do that now the dark side of the moon one was that of course it's this uh, spectrum what do you call it diffraction thing so what happens is that the the single light the white light hits the prism and then it's separated out into the eight different colors and i, I this is a kind of like a form of disaggregation this is the metaphor so the idea is this, that when you are only familiar with one tradition, then you tend to think there is like a problem or a question, because that's the question that's being posed within your culture. But then when you look at other cultures, you realize that perhaps there isn't one question after all, there are six or seven, three or four, whatever it might be. And so, for example, if you take the question of free will, a lot of people are obsessed by the problem of free will. I think it's the most difficult and pressing an urgent problem in, in philosophy. But the problem of free will, as we know it, is something that emerges very specifically in the Western tradition. And in fact, there are numerous ways of thinking about responsibility and agency and autonomy, which actually 
frame the whole issue in a totally different way. So I think it kind of like, it's a way of like freeing yourself from only seeing um, issues through one lens and gives you an idea that you know, there may be several different lenses there. The other two metaphors, one was this uh, cubist elephant picture. And this uh, alludes to a very famous uh, allegory which actually originated in Buddhism, but really became appropriated by the Jains. The Jains, the key Jain doctrine is one of called a many sidedness. And there, the idea is there is no kind of a single truth, that truth is many sided. And this the parable of the elephant is meant to illustrate this. There's a blind, uh, a, a king, an elephant is brought before the king, and then a load of blind men are, are, are asked to, to describe the elephant to the king but they all only sort of feel a part of the elephant so to someone who feels the tail it's a, it's a soft fluffy animal to someone who feels the uh, tusk it's a hard and solid thing and so forth and the point of the parable is that you know the elephant is all of these things and uh, no one perspective captures captures everything and I think it is true that when you when you look at cultures on your own you have that idea that you can see things with very different perspectives and you can build up a more complete picture um and the cubist analogy is is in that kind of strange cubist way you know um there is there is no one angle which you can see everything but you can you can piece it together and get a fuller picture in that sense and the third picture i had was of uh, it showed a railway and roads and birds flying. I shame I couldn't get a river in as well. Um, and that was really pointing to the fact that, you know, if you think the fundamental question of how we ought to live, um, I don't think anyone should be an absolute relativist and say anything goes, because no, I don't think anything does go. I don't think, uh, I don't think there's any way to live if you have a society where there's. Uh, female genital mutilation. I don't think there's any room for societies with slavery. Um, there are many, many unacceptable ways of living. But that doesn't mean there's only one good way to live. There's more than one good way to live, both for an individual and perhaps for organising a society. And I think it's useful to be open up to that idea and to, to recognise the fact that there, there, there can be more than one useful, useful way to, good way to live. Excellent. And we've uh, got another question from Colin, who's asking, is existential risk an idea present in non-Western philosophy or only in self-absorbed Western thought? Can I ask Colin if he, if he would to um, unmute himself and, and explain that a bit? Uh, I just want to be clear what he means by existential risk as an idea. Hello, it's Colin. Hello, Colin. Yeah. Um, well, the notion that there isn't a long future for humanity, um, that in various ways, there are, I mean, the pandemics exhibited a slight version of what might have been or, or could be an existential risk, but there are many possible ways that the human race no longer will exist. And is that something that in the East is considered and thought about? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question, and I'm reluctant to give any kind of definite answer to this because, you know, that would require me to perhaps you know be familiar with social attitude surveys and everything, which which, which I'm kind of not. And I think that the, the problems of existential risk, kind of uh, you know, such that they are real, are are real for everyone around the world, not just for people in the West. But I do think that there are um, sort of ways of thinking which are going to make this question, as it were, seem more or less of a natural pressing, pressing one. Um, and I think in particular, um, in, in Western thought, uh, I think particularly because of the influence of, of Christianity, we, we do have this very kind of linear view of, of history and of time, you know, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And there's always been this mythology of the end times, you know, and I think that kind of, you know, the eschatological thinking of everything means that I think that in the Western imagination, the very real possibility of an existential threat of extermination 
it seems seems it's easy to make that seem real because it's kind of there it's sort of built in to our background ways of thinking i think however it is true that in lots of other parts of the world that's not the assumption the assumption is more of a kind of a cyclical idea of time or it's a less non-linear one uh, so in Taoism, you know, this, the, the changing of the seasons, things come and things go. Uh, in, in Buddhist thought, that's, everything is impermanent, you know, so uh, uh, nothing is going to last. So there's nothing particularly special about, it's not like humanity is going to exist and it's going to stop existing because uh, we're, we're all in flux all the time. Personal identity is a matter of something that's all, always in change. So I certainly think that, in cultures which don't have that strong idea of the, a sort of a linear kind of eschatological idea of history and time, which rather see things more in terms of patterns and cycles and, and human beings are essentially, I guess, being less important in that. The, the, the story of the, the earth is not the story of um, a creation with, with human beings in its center and with our destiny there. We are just part of this bigger thing. I think that kind of, um, existential risk idea is going to be uh, a less natural thing to reach to but what i wouldn't want to conclude from that is that you know if you're if you're in the chinese government or the japanese government or the indian government they're not um getting serious wonks and looking at the possibility that we might actually do ourselves in <laughs> thank you thanks colin and now we've got a question from stephen says uh, you spoke comparatively about east and west philosophy does your book cover native american and african philosophical positions or dogmas and how would they fundamentally differ to western and eastern philosophy yeah no very interesting i mean i i don't actually i mean there are a few complete gaps and and um the the americas i don't have anything on uh the native people the first peoples of the americas i do have some some stuff on african philosophy and Aboriginal Australian philosophy. Um, it does always, it does seem that in these sort of oral traditions from more traditional societies, there are certain kind of commonalities there, although I wouldn't like to, 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 to speculate um, about what I don't know about the Americas. Um, and I think there are a few things that, that, that come in there. I mean, one again is the, in terms of, I talked about the relationality of the self in East Asian thought and everything. In traditional societies, there's often an idea of a, a fundamental kinship which extends to the land. The land is often a, a really a strong part of identity. You may remember a, a few years ago that actually in New Zealand, they granted um, legal personhood to a river which was sacred to the Maori. And, um, you know, I think it's one of those things that if you read that in a vacuum, it might just sound, well, this is bonkers and this is crazy. But it makes sense when you kind of think that you, you, you conceive of yourself as being, you know, tied, tied to the land. And the land is where you come from. It's, it's where you go back to. It's your, your people's history is tied up in it. And I think that's rather important. Now, of course, a lot of people jump on that and say that this is a great resource for ecological thinking. And it is to a certain extent, but it's not inevitably, it doesn't inevitably lead to more ecological uh, behaviours, right? Um, so, for example, I mean, actually, uh, in terms of destruction, I think a lot of cultures in which, for example, the kinship with the animal, it's very interesting, the, um, the Maasai have have a real kinship with the, the cow, right? But they also kill the cow and eat the cow and they slaughter it, right? Uh, they, they probably wouldn't slaughter it to extinction, but that would be for, 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 for pragmatic reasons. In the same kind of way, uh, there's a really interesting sort of uh, story told of, a, of an Aboriginal um, kind of elder and thinker and sage who was driving with this uh, whitey um, anthropologist and you know, he, threw, he threw his beer can out the window of the car, right? And that's because in his view, everything has its place in, in nature. Everything finds its place, you know? So that the, the idea was being embedded in the land, actually in that case led to a behavior which um, from, from a certain point of view is, is actually more harmful because, you know, it's not us spoiling nature because there's no distinction between us and nature as on our land. 
So I, I think it is interesting. There are resources there for helping us to think ecologically, but one mustn't romanticize uh, these ideas and, and imagine that, that comes from. I think the other thing is there's a very interesting idea um, in, in African philosophy. The, the idea is Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a, a southern, comes from southern Africa, but there are similar ideas which um, are found in other parts of Africa too. And again, this takes this idea of relationality again to a kind of a, perhaps a slightly more intimate kind of idea. And yeah, there's no real word to translate Ubuntu, but it is, it is like um, our, our, our being in each other, you know, that we are because of, I am because of you, you are because of me. And that is interesting in the way in which it affects political decision making, because actually um, in this sort of, in cultures of this Ubuntu thing is important, decision making is about reaching consensus. It's not about a majority vote or even about the chief declaring. It's about consensus. And it was said in the Durban climate change talks, I can't remember the year, um, which, which were ended quite successfully for these things. They actually explicitly used these Ubuntu principles in in the negotiations and, and claimed it as part of the success. And uh, that leads beautifully on to the next question from Nicola. Do you see philosophical traditions at work in the struggles of broad spectrum political endeavours, such as the G7 and on climate change? Would finding ways to connect these traditions impact on the discussions? Um. I don't, I'm not sure, I'm not sure about that, to be honest, because I think that a lot of these discussions at the intergovernmental level um, often do boil down to, you know, comp competing self-interests. And, you know, that's one of those things where, you know, philosophy is important, but it's not always uh, the most important thing. Sometimes there's something simpler at work. So I don't know, I'm, I'm gonna slightly fudge that one. I, I think it'd be interesting for someone to look at those issues and see if they could spot something out there. <coughs> Pardon me. I'm not ruling it out, but it's not, it's not obvious to me the, what, what, those, what those things are. So I'm afraid unsatisfactory answer for me there. Mark Hobson has asked, do you have a personal philosophy of life? Um, that's too big a question, really, isn't it? Um, in a way, uh, I, I don't have a personal one in the sense that I don't, I haven't invented one for myself. And I do think that one of the things I find a bit dispiriting sometimes about philosophy enthusiasts and professional philosophers too, is that sometimes people think that it's more important to have their theory than it is to have the right theory. <laughs> um, everyone's got, wants to have their own original take on something. I just think that all the big questions have been asked and, um, you know, there's not much. So, so in, in forming your personal philosophy, you're, 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 you're selecting your own kind of you know, it's like going to a buffet and trying to put something together, but something together that works, you know. Um, I think often the kind of pick and mix approach to philosophical ideas uh, doesn't work because the combinations just are inconsistent with each other. Um, but I try to put something together like that. If I ask, well, what is, is my personal philosophy of life? Um, in broad terms, I, it is, you know, it belongs in the family of the, the humanist family, you'll be pleased to hear. You know, I, I am fundamentally what we call a naturalist. I think the natural world is all that there is. And I don't think that saying that that includes God and spirits and things um, works, because I, I think that in postulating those things in a meaningful sense, you are postulating something that's outside of the natural world. Uh, we're caught in our own mortality. And I think that that's it. And I think that in terms of how my own personal philosophy has been uh, changed by uh, looking at um, non-Western philosophy, I think it has very much, um, you know, it, it's pushed it more in that direction of that kind of appreciation of um, you know, impermanence and change and transition, which is very strong 
Uh, I think most people would, would recognize that from Buddhist philosophy because they, they know that. But I think also in sort of a lot of Japanese thought. And in particular, I think the thing about Japanese thought, which I think is, is so important, is that uh, the idea of the, 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 the bitter and the sweet being together is the idea of mono no wawe, which is the, the pathos of things. And the, the idea that, you know, uh, because everything is impermanent, because everything is, is, is changing, um, that's, that provides the opportunities for joy and delight and appreciation of being alive. But you can't pretend it also uh, creates a certain sort of bitterness and sadness. And so it's, it's no coincidence that the major annual festival in Japan is the Hanami, which is the cherry blossom uh, festival. So when the cherry blossom comes out, people picnic under the cherry blossom. And the point is, it's beautiful and it's lovely, but it is very, very short-lived. And the first strong gust, the winds, and it's gone. And it's that really sort of completely dwelling in that moment of appreciation, but appreciation in the knowledge of its passing, which brings with it a certain sadness. I think that's the best kind of version I can, I can give on that. Thanks for that. And uh, we've got a question from Andrew. How do other traditions view Western philosophy? A very interesting question. I think that there's an asymmetry of ignorance, as someone put it, which is that actually a lot of these traditions are very interested in Western philosophy. Um, so I went to the uh, annual Indian Philosophical Congress, and there people are giving papers on, you know, from the orthodox schools and the heterodox schools in India, but loads of reference to, you know, Kant and Hegel, Plato, Aristotle, all of these people, a real sort of deep interest in that. Similarly, you know, in Japan, um, there's, there's quite a lot of interest, particularly actually in, in uh, continental phenomenology, existentialism. Uh, and, and so there is this kind of thing whereby there is a lot of interest in, in Western philosophy uh, and an interest which isn't always uh, reciprocated right so uh which is which is which is a real shame in the case of india it was interesting in india i felt a real real tension i think there was a lot of resentment there and i think this is probably what you find elsewhere that people are a bit kind of sick of the um sort of sense of superiority which uh the west seems to have about itself and it's disinterest in other cultures. And so, I mean, actually, I mean, there, there, I, I heard a few, I think completely unfair, <laughs> uh, sort of like a complete sort of like trashing of Western thought as being responsible for nihilism and suicide and death and all this kind of stuff, which is a bit extreme, but I think that there is there's that too. So it, it's, there, there's a lot of interest, a lot of willingness to learn, but also sometimes a bit of, a bit of resentment. But, you know, even the negative emotions, they do show an engagement with it. Whereas actually the other way around, it's kind of disinterest. And it's interesting, every five years, there's something called the World Congress of Philosophy. And it's held in different places. And frankly, you don't, it's not something that the British and American um, philosophical communities take at all seriously. Even though sometimes their philosophers are invited by the host nations to come and give talks there. In fact, Britain doesn't have an official representative on the um, International Society of Philosophical Associations, which organizes it. We don't even have a member, we don't have a, a member of it, it's so disinterested. So yeah, yeah, um, that's the answer to that one. 